Uh, in the second session, we continue to uh, discuss more deeply the implementation of the Chinese Belt and uh, Road Initiative in Central Asia with the emphasis on economy. So China, China's economic uh, ties are integral uh, to regional cooperation. Given the Beijing's significant role as an investor in Central Asia, we are interested in discussing the economic uh, consequences of the coronavirus. The, the main question is how the slowdown in the Chinese economy can affect the projects of uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So let me give you the uh, so let me give the floor to the Dr. Catherine Owen, the British Academy postdoctoral fellow. Uh, Dr. Owen, please go ahead. You have uh, time up to 10 minutes. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for having me on this um, online discussion. It's really, really interesting. It's also my first uh, online conference and um, yeah, it seems to be going really well so far. So. Perhaps this could be a blueprint uh, for the future. Um, so, um, yeah, I am going to give basically a brief overview of the emerging economic impacts of COVID-19 on China and Central Asia. Uh, and then I'm going to outline two scenarios. Um, of course, we all know that uh, Central Asian countries are strongly reliant on the Chinese economy, uh, with China before the crisis being the destination for about a fifth of all Central Asian exports and a third of their imports. So of course, what happens in the Chinese economy will have a huge impact on Central Asian economies. Um, so um, just according to the latest sort of data that has come out in the last week, um, we can see that in the first quarter of 2020, the Chinese economy shrank by nearly 7% compared to the same time last year. Imports fell by nearly 3% and exports fell by over 13%. Um, however, to put this in a global context, the World Trade Organization uh, expects global trade to fall by 32% uh, in 2020. Um, of course, um, developing countries, uh, including Central Asia, are going to be the hardest hit by COVID-19. Um, in, uh, in Central Asia, the uh, largely remittance-based economies uh, of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are being hit as swathes of migrant workers are laid off from their jobs in Russia. Uh, and the largely resource-based economies of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, they are hit by plummeting oil and gas prices. All countries, of course, have fragile healthcare systems. Um, and on the 26th of March, Kyrgyzstan became the, uh, the world's first country to receive uh, 120 million soft loan from the uh, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, to tackle the economic impact of uh, COVID-19. Um, so I'll just quickly uh, outline uh, sort of Chinese um, approach to overseas investments. So uh, as, as is obviously well known, China has, uh, Chinese, Chinese lenders have lent billions of dollars to Central Asia uh, with loans uh, often secured against commodities, meaning that when borrowers default, countries must cede natural resources or infrastructure apparatus. So whether Chinese lenders will restructure these loans or press for repayments remains to be seen. But we, I think we can look to uh, the case of Africa to sort of see uh, what Chinese practices uh, might be. Um, so in the past, Chinese lenders have either written off debt to African countries or they've restructured it. Um, and uh, towards the beginning of April, a Chinese spokesperson did say that China is considering working on a bilateral basis to restructure debt repayments uh, more broadly. Um, it's unlikely that it would join the sort of uh, wider push uh, by the, I think it's the, was it the Jubilee debt campaign to uh, collectively uh, write off African debt. Um, but there are also, I think it's important to, to, to note that there are no examples to date of China seizing assets. So with all this in, in mind then, let's uh, just think about uh, two scenarios, um, how this could play out. Um, the first one is that um, Chinese investors take advantage of the dire global situation and purchase greater amounts of failing assets overseas. And then the other one is that uh, China reigns in its overseas loans and development projects and turns its economic focus inward. So I'll just, there are sort of a bit of evidence uh, for both of these theories. Regarding the first one, so we're seeing greater levels of engagement, uh, not only in Central Asia, but I suppose also uh, in the world. Um, so I think at the end of March, it was about a month ago, um, an economist at the People's Bank of China stated that local governments are likely to respond by investing in high cost infrastructure projects, uh, which will be supported by uh, trillions of yuan 
of local government bonds being released as fiscal stimulus. So local governments then at China's peripheries, um, including in, in, in Xinjiang and also perhaps in Yunnan and other places, um, will uh, might choose to expand already extensive cross-border cooperation with low-income neighboring countries. Um, also just last week, uh, NATO warned uh, its members that China might take advantage uh, of uh, the economic slowdown in, in the West and buy up um, important strategic assets. Um, there is little concrete evidence to, put, to support this claim so far, but obviously reports have been emerging that the Chinese economy is getting back on track much more quickly after the crisis as has been uh, mentioned by other speakers. So of course this is a possibility. Um, and then moving on to the second, uh, um, uh, the second sort of uh, projection that actually China will uh, rein in its overseas activities. So while it was already slowing in uh, 2019 due to the US-China trade war, uh, Chinese overseas investments are predicted uh, to slow uh, because of low levels of liquidity and uh, directions from government to channel what cash they do have into the domestic economy first and foremost. Um, and then also as you know, on a purely practical uh, level, as has been mentioned by other speakers, um, the restrictions on population movement, of course, mean that uh, BRI projects actually cannot really currently physically uh, take place. Um, so um, I think there's one thing that I'd like to just mention before concluding is that, of course, I think we have to be really careful about speaking of China or Ch the Chinese, China as a sort of unitary actor. There are numerous different Chinese lenders, including banks, China-led multilateral organizations, state-owned enterprises, even wealthy individuals, and each of these uh, have slightly different priorities, different regulations, different strategies. And so to talk about, yeah, this sort of, you know, singular, coherent, coordinated overseas strategy is perhaps a bit of an oversimplica oversimplification. Therefore, we might see in some areas uh, a ramping up of Chinese uh, engagement or perhaps a, a withdrawal in others, depending on uh, the specific uh, in investor or, or economic actor. Um, and then I suppose just very briefly before concluding, uh, I'd like to say that I think two things we really need to, 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 to talk about in this regard is how Chinese investment actually exacerbates economic um, inequality in uh, Central Asia and uh, corruption as well due to its very uh, lack of oversight um, transparency measures uh, in its um, uh, economic dealings. Um, so I think that should always be a part of the conversation when we're thinking about, um, yeah, how the economic impacts of um, Chinese activities in Central Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Owen, for your uh, such informative speech uh, with uh, building uh, two different scenarios, how the things can go. Indeed, uh, we often forget that the, the crisis is a time of opportunity and someone can uh, win from, for, from this situation. On the other hand, as you said, the 2019 trade war between the United States and the China uh, could make PRC to pay more attention to the domestic economy. So it's interesting to see that the battle of these two giants uh, may affect the projects in Central Asia. Uh, I think the next two commenters will also have an interesting opinion uh, on this topic. I pass the word to uh, Mr. Uh, Arne Cornelison. Uh, dear Mr. Cornelison, the floor is yours. You have uh, two, three minutes for a short comment on this subject. Thank you very much. I would just like to uh, provide some brief comments, to particularly what uh, Roman and, uh, and uh, Anton, but also what Catherine mentioned. And I think that, uh, yes, I mean, we're gonna see now a, probably one to two, three years maybe, or one to two years, well, where a range of projects uh, across Central Asia related to uh, the One Belt strategy will uh, basically be, be stopped. We'll be waiting until the projects can resume because of lockdown. And I completely agree with what Catherine said that, you know, there's not one single Chinese big project. There are a range of different players, but, but on the financial scene, on the technical scene, I mean, companies involved, I mean, there are a range of different players, but I just had to really kind of provide some, you know, overarching lines because of the limited time I had. Uh, and the thing, what I look at the same thing is important also is to consider is that China's one belt, one, one road strategy is not a one year or a five year project. This is a strategy for the next centuries, basically. And I think we'll, if we look at the Eurasian continent, if we look at the massive Eurasian continent, 
there is very limited infrastructure capacity on the continent today which connects the east of Asia with Europe. There is fairly limited. Therefore, I think there is a need for more infrastructure capacity and more transport corridors, more railroad uh, possibilities and more highway possibilities in order to transport goods, services, people uh, and products in the future. I think also when we, if we look at what and how will one belt, the One Belt strategy influence economically Central Asia, I saw there were some questions about that. Well, I mean, first of all, currently, what I'm uh, hearing is that the flow of transportation from uh, China across to Kazakhstan is basically the same as it was before COVID-19. Even uh, they were also increased a little bit. That is one point, important point. Secondly, if we look at specific logistics clusters, such as Korgos, such as Aktau and others, we are seeing basically a nexus of logistics, transportation, special economic zones and trade increasing and gravitating people towards it and companies towards it. Yes, there will be inequality, there will be challenges, and yes, there might also be corruption. Cannot dispute that at all, which Catherine raised, and I think that's important. Um, but the general overarching trend, I think, is that we will see an econ increased economic growth because of the introduction of a range of different One Belt, One Road projects across Central Asia, with Russia, uh, South in, in South Asia, et cetera. So that is kind of the general trend. But as, yes, there will be major risks, there will be challenges. And also there was a question in terms of how potentially the COVID-19 may influence perception of Chinese workers. Well, unfortunately, that may happen in some instances. Um, we are seeing uh, tragically an, an increase of racism in the dialogue in social media and in other instances that uh, must be stopped uh, in the way it can be, um, you know, because I think it's important to build dialogue, but there will be challenges and there will be diplomatic disputes, which was also raised, I think, by Roman. And I think that's, that's a very fair point. Um, there might also be, as we see now, possible lawsuits, uh, diplomatic quarrels, uh, in fighting. Um, but overall, in the longer term, when the COVID-19 effects calm down and we see, when we see a reemergence of the global economy over the next three to five, seven years, because it will take a few years before the global economy really comes back on its feet, I think that we will see stabilization over time and the resumption of the projects. Thank you, Mr. Cornelison, for this valuable comment. Uh, I think uh, everybody hoped that the global economy, along with the Chinese economy, Will, will be will stabilize in in the coming years next years so the next commander is uh, dr uh, raman vakulchuk raman please go ahead yeah thank you uh, well i would like to stress uh, two main points that i think would be uh, quite crucial for uh, chinese engagement with central asia and also for the central asian uh, sort of engagement with uh, with china i think here uh, it would be very i mean both sides really need to to redefine their approaches to, uh, the, to the Belt and Road Initiative in a sense that what we see now and when we see now at the, when we look at the impact, what we see is that actually many local contractors are on the verge of be, being bankrupt. Also, I mean, because of this, many of the projects have been stopped. Uh, actually, there's no uh, insurance, I would say, that would sort of cover for the risks of such situation. Uh, which means that this actually increases the costs. And uh, I mean, the costs of uh, not being uh, able to implement the, those projects, especially the, given the fact that uh, many countries, like small countries like Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, they have uh, borrowed a lot of uh, different loans. And now the question is how to uh, solve uh, the situation concerning the insurance scheme and all these losses that uh, local contractors are, are going to carry. So it, what's really important is that uh, China, but also Central Asia, they come up with a strategy of sort of reconsidering and taking into account those risks that are already there and that we see now all those uh, losses. So it would be really important to look at the terms of the uh, new projects, as well as maybe reconsider some of the uh, terms of the projects that have been already started in Central Asia. Uh, also, maybe adding a lot of uh, emphasis on the, uh, you know, such things as actually also work, workforce health. We already see, you know, some uh, concerns in the region that uh, about the participation of the local workforce in the Chinese projects, and there's some mounting evidence showing that, well, there are also a lot of 
Also, how about the, uh, and uh, we did a big study last year where we collected the data for one, 261 Chinese projects, including uh, uh, Belt and Road projects and also bilateral projects. And we see a lot of uh, very uh, weak coordination. And then also the, the, this issue was raised uh, uh, already that, well, in fact, uh, there's actually not well uh, develop coordination on the Chinese side, but also in, in Central Asia. But I can get to this more in my uh, next panel to, to give you some more details on this. Thank you, Dr. Vagulchuk, for your valuable comment. So, uh, concluding up the, on this session, we have uh, discussed how the uh, changing economic situation in China uh, influence will somehow or somehow already influence the implementation of the BRI in Central Asia. Let me pass the floor to my colleague Nargiza, who starts the third session. Nargiza.